Hi and welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm Simon and today I am back with some non-fiction November recommendations and also a request which will come later on in the video for you to help me pick out of these books which ones I should be heading to this month. I will however be trying to read more non-fiction books in 2024 than I have this year as in 2023 I have only read I think about 14 or 15 non-fiction books which is pretty poor. I didn't used to read hardly any actually so it has got better but there was a boom a few years ago I think it was in like 2018 2019 when I was reading quite a lot and then I think with the thing that shall not be named and the fact that I was kind of addicted to the news I stopped reading anything that felt like news which not all non-fiction does but I guess I just needed escape in fiction which is probably the thing well even more of an escape into fiction because I do love me some fiction but we're not talking about fiction we're talking about non-fiction so first off I'm going to tell you about a selection of non-fiction books that I have read this year because I don't have all of them to hand but we'll discuss that in a bit and then like I said we'll be heading to this big pile of books where I'll be giving you a elevator pitch and seeing which ones you would like to see me get to in the forthcoming weeks and then the rest I'll just try and fit into my reading diet throughout the rest of the year and indeed 2024, although I do have all of these books on my non-fiction shelves behind me. Anyway, let's get cracking with the ones that I have read this year. And I haven't done these in any order other than kind of size order for the thumbnail, let's be honest. First of the bunch is A History of My Brief Body by Billy Ray Belcour, which I had wanted to read for quite a while ever since I saw it on, I think it was Benjamin's channel and then I think I saw Renee read it I'll link their channels down below maybe even Nathan too and they got me intrigued but it was definitely Benjamin that was for me I think the initial spark because he raved about it and this is Billy Ray Belcour's not memoir exactly but it's lots of essays based on his experience and kind of what it's like for him as a queer man in Canada but also a queer NDN or native Indian in Canada and what it's like actually to be queer within that community itself and there's some really really sometimes quite hard to read but really fascinating thoughts and opinions and little moments where he'll give you like a little there'll be like it can happen in a paragraph it can happen in a line that something will spark in your brain you'll go off thinking about it even more and that's what I really love when I get some cooking non-fiction I also really love the way he writes about sex and how we can often use sex as a power as a way to sort of block out the rest of the world it looks at how we can be accepted or rejected or how we can even be fetishized and it's just really really fascinating a, a really really great almost like a pocketbook of power I want to say but um yeah that, that feels like it sort of diminishes it and because there's it's so slight but there's just so much it's brilliant then two books by the next author and I had the delight of interviewing Emma at Hay for Sky Arts these are what white people can do next from Allyship to Coalition which looks at that very thing these are these really short brilliant essays that give you again these little sparks to really go away and think about and what Emma does here is look at the problems around allyship and how problematic it can be and how performative it can be, but also gives us an insight as to why coalition is so much more powerful and something that we should be aiming for. Brilliant. And then we have Don't Touch My Hair. It looks at the sort of cultural discourse around hair and how women of colour and their hair have been used in certain ways in marketing and in society. There's some really fascinating bits of history in here and I switched to listening to this book in the lead up to Hey because I had a lot that I was reading physically and wanted something that I could listen to when I was here there and everywhere and Emma's sense of humour is just so brilliant in this that I absolutely loved it and it felt like you even though it was a one-way conversation you were having a really lovely chat with her so there are those two. Another author who I read several non-fiction books by one which sadly I think ended up left on the set and vanished and then the other one which I've learned out because it's about his um, time filming one of the cult classic films he's in I should say sorry it's Richard E Grant and this is a pocket full of happiness it's Richard telling us all about um, his wife Joan becoming ill and getting a diagnosis a terminal diagnosis and the time leading up to her death 
and then also looking back at their relationship and how they got together and his career throughout that time. And it's all about how Joan really wanted him to have a pocket full of happiness every single day. And it's just so honest and so raw. And sometimes you feel, it's almost like uncomfortable how open and raw Richard can be but there's just so much um, generosity in that, that I think this is great. And I think anyone who has gone through grief or is going through grief should give this a read because I think it is really powerful and looks at celebrating life, celebrating other people's lives and making the most of our lives and just finding those little pocketfuls of happiness. They don't have to be something huge. They can be, you know, all sorts of things. So yeah, absolutely brill. Then also on Hay, um, which is actually interesting that that's how I ended up with so much non-fiction because otherwise there wouldn't have been very much this year because I think it's only one, two, three, four books that I would have picked up possibly myself without doing Sky and other initiatives, which we'll come up to. But um, anyway, Bats Timbo's main character, Energy. Now, I was a bit dubious about this. I didn't know much about Bats Timbo and then found out that she's like a superstar on TikTok. And I was a bit like, oh, is this going to be one of those like cash in memoir kind of books? But it's not. This is Ten Commandments for Living Life Fearlessly. And what Bats does is she writes about her life as a woman of colour who has dwarfism, although she prefers to be called a little person. And it's how all the things that she's gone through have created sort of her desire to have this main character energy, but also have kind of come this core power within her. I do have a little issue around the whole terminology of main character energy, because if we're all a main character, it kind of makes everyone else either Tran, what's the word I want to use? Um, transitory in our life, transitional in our life, a bit of like something that we just move past, but also secondary, maybe a bit lesser. And I'm not sure that's the vibe that I want to be projecting. And that isn't really what Fats is projecting in this book, because as you read it, you read about the things she's gone through, then you get like a takeaway, which is like a digestible version of it and how you can apply it to your life. And then there are parts of the book where you are left to reflect and fill in yourself what, you're, what you've gained from each of the commandments. It's a really, really interesting idea and kind of took me back to like, do you remember when we had filofaxes, if you're of my generation or above, and how you get questions then and have to fill things out and give it to the test. And I realised that I do that with my passion planner, which is a monthly planner. Not for that. It asks you to have kind of have your goals every month, but then at the end you reflect on what you've got out of the month. Yeah, really, really interesting this one. Then onto a book that I was very excited for, as um, I love the author dearly. It's Elizabeth Day's Friendaholic, Confessions of a Friendship Addict. And this book does really look at friendship, warts and all, well not literally warts and all, but you know what I mean. Looking at the complexities of different friendships that we have, the fact that some friendships are not forever, they're kind of at different points in your life, although there are some that do last forever and ever and ever. And what I loved is how Elizabeth looks in, there's quite a lot of talk around how it's almost like a solar system of friendship and how you kind of become aligned or sort of swirl around each other, which I really, really loved, and inside, as she did write. Uh, forever grateful for our orbits colliding which I thought was lovely because I really really loved all of the space analogy in here because also sometimes we need space from people and sometimes we need them to be much closer and all of that is in here as well as just really fantastic insights from either her friends about their friendships which is really interesting to look at and also just from different people on the friendships that they've had in their lives. And I thought that was really, really brilliantly done. I know Lena absolutely loved this as well. And I feel like she may have done a whole video on it, which I will try and link down below. This was an absolute corker. And I loved Elizabeth's How to Fail. I love philosophy. Again, this, it just really makes you think, but also makes you feel a bit seen and a bit understood, but also sometimes question your own behaviours at certain points. So really, really good stuff. Then, a book that I haven't talked about on the channel, which is one that I read for the Royal Society of Literature Christopher Bland Prize, and I've got two of those, and again, I probably wouldn't have headed to these two books if they hadn't been on a list of books that I had to read for work. This first one is Freedom to Think 
by Susie Allegory and it's the long struggle to liberate our minds. I have to say, I don't feel like this book is very pick up -able. It looks a little bit daunting. I feel like this is screaming emergency, which it does sort of talk about a little bit in terms of that we are at sort of an emergency point in terms of social media and information, especially with big tech companies. Um, this looks at that. It looks at how much information we're sharing, how much information we could be. Can you hear Oscar really wants to come in? You coming in? Come on. Come on then. He can open the door. He knows what he's doing. It's not properly shut. I mean, he can't do handles yet, but one day maybe. Anyway, moving on. This really surprised me because it was far more readable than I thought it was going to be from the blurb, the cover, that whole thing. Oscar, here he is. But also, um, I just found it really interesting the way that it looked at how we're using social media. Oh, that's the door banging. How we... Um, do give away so much online, be it to tech companies, like I was saying, or indeed to other people. And that has given me food for thought. Freedom to think, food for thought, I would definitely say. Uh, no, Oscar, not on the carpet. No, it doesn't listen to me. Absolutely doesn't listen to me. It doesn't care. Anyway, I had a real emotional connection with this book, which is Love from the Pink Palace by Jill Nalder. And Jill was the, um, inspiration for the character Jill in It's a Sin, which if you've not seen, you have to. It looks at the 1980s and the AIDS epidemic so frankly and heartbreakingly. And I remember mum talking about that and saying how, and I think this is what this book does so brilliantly, that show captured the joy of the queer community and how utterly broken and decimated it was by this cruel disease. And this is what Jill looks at. It looks at what her life was like before the um, AIDS epidemic. It then looks at how her life was during it. And she look, well, she shares her experiences. She shares the stories of the men that she knew from the time and their families. And it's just really, really brilliant. Again, another really raw, open, honest account. I just thought this was phenomenal. And then on to um, the other three books that I would have picked up this year regardless, because like I said, well, that makes it sound like, yeah, well, I've been honest about it. I don't tend to turn to nonfiction that much. So these three books I was all excited for in different ways, just as I was Elizabeth Days. I should have put them all together, really. The first of those is Divine Might by Natalie Haynes, which by the time this goes live, I should have finished because I've only got the Furies to go. I've been reading this really slowly, and actually I've switched the audio, but really slowly since September. And I have found it so interesting in a way I wasn't expecting. So this is, I should say, goddesses in Greek myth. And we do get some of the myths which these goddesses are linked to. Um, we don't have all the goddesses, but we have quite a few of them. And it then looks at how they have influenced sort of pop culture today. And that wasn't kind of what I was expecting. I was expecting it to be literally all the Greek myths the goddesses were in and highlighting their roles and parts within those, which would have been an absolute, like that would have been possibly quadruple the size, which I wouldn't mind Natalie Haynes doing. If she wants to do that, please do. Oh, that's the front door, one second. So, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, this, as I was saying, looks at how they have influenced pop culture. So for example, you have the muses in Disney's Hercules, which I really, really want to watch now because I haven't, shame on me. But you also have Lady Gaga's Venus video, or you'll have uh, the Hunger Games. Now I have to say, this was something that didn't always work for me reading it because no matter how brilliant Natalie Haynes' writing is, or anyone's writing is, if they're just telling you the plot and their personal take on a movie or piece of art or piece of music that you've not seen, it can be a bit unintentionally, I don't know, make you feel a bit distanced from everything. Whereas interestingly, listening to Natalie tell you about any art or pop culture or anything that you haven't experienced yourself was fabulous. And that just, yeah, I was particularly pleased to read about Hestia, who doesn't have very much written about her. Um, also, 
Demeter and the Persephone myth is one of my favourites and that is in here too along with Athena, along with Hera, she's a one, uh, the Muses and uh, several others and like I said I've got the Furies to go. So there we have that. And ultimately of the non-fiction books that I've read this year and really enjoyed is Melanie Sykes' Illuminated, Autism and the Things I've Left Unsaid and Melanie and I got to know each other thanks to books and booktubers we had a book club together and it's been a real treat and actually it's just been a real um honor to host events with around the country and see how this book is connecting her with other people with autism who maybe had a later diagnosis or who are just going through it now and finding out at different ages and that's what this very much is this is in well i say that it's mainly about Melanie finding out she's autistic, she had a breakdown and then looked back on her life through this autistic lens and how things had gone the way they'd gone. There's some absolutely beautiful writing about her childhood in the north of England and also um, when she writes about going to India to see her um, place that her mother's family came from is just gorgeous too. It's also a really interesting look at fame and the pitfalls of fame and I just think it's one of those books that sort of you come away feeling illuminated about yourself but also about Melanie and about all the things that she wants to talk about here including autism so really 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 recommend that also very good on audio oh I did say that I switched to audio on this one didn't I and um yeah Natalie's sense of humor comes to the fore even more then the asides are witty anyway in here but even more so when you listen to it and then last of the books uh, the non-fiction books that I've read this year that I would heartily recommend and this could be sort of put in cookery rather than necessarily non-fiction however it is also a diary of sorts this is Andy Oliver's The Pepper Pot Diaries which is as I mentioned a fabulous cookbook with wonderful recipes that come from her family from history I mean look at those they are curried carrot scones god they sound gorgeous or do i say scone scones or scone i'm not sure which i've also got sticky star fruit pork chops oh there's just so many things in here that are utterly delicious um but also as i mentioned this is a diary that uh, andy wrote while she was in the caribbean um unable to get home due to covid and it looks at her relationship with food it also celebrates all the wonderful women in her life and it's just an absolute treat and i should say i'll be in conversation with andy and with melanie on the 18th with melanie and 19th of november with andy at chester literature festival i'll put tickets for those down below there will be treats so moving on now to the books that i would like you to help me pick from for non-fiction november in the coming weeks and I'm, like i said i'm going to do these in a very quick kind of elevator pitch way so first up disobedient bodies by emma dabbery and this is reclaim your unruly beauty and looks at the beauty industry i think it'll be brilliant we have sean hewitt's all down darkness wide which is all about him and his partner his partner having um, depression and how that affected their relationship i want to read that for ages we have Kurawan by Bronwyn Adcock. This is the story of a fire or the dreadful um, fires in Australia and I've read a few books around those and find it haunting and heartbreaking but also oddly hopeful in humanity and nature-ish if you know what I mean. That's longer than a sentence sorry. Then we have a book that I think is going to give me the On the Red Hill by Mike Parker buys, which is a book I loved. This is A Home for All Seasons by Gavin Plumley, And this is about him and his partner doing up this old house and finding out the kind of history of it um, and celebrating art, history, landscape, all those kind of things. Again, not really a sentence. Then we have Young Bloomsbury by Nino Stracci, a, a new queer history. I don't really know what this is about, but I'm assuming the Bloomsbury group, yes, who became notorious in the 1920s. I don't know very much about those, so that could be interesting. 
Then, Samantha Irby's latest essay collection, Quietly Hostile, I think Samantha Irby is hilarious. And also, I will say on record, the episodes of uh, Not Sex and the City, and just like that, that she writes are the best ones. There we are, I won't hear anything against that. Then we have a cheeky book in terms of cover. This is Fire Island, A Queer History by Jack Parler, which looks at the history of Fire Island, which is a queer cult and cultural, I get, mm, depends on your term of cultural, I guess, maybe, site. So this could be interesting. I bought it for the bottom. Let's not lie. Then we have We Should Not Be Friends, A Story of Unlikely Friendship, which is interesting because I mentioned Elizabeth Day's book on friendship earlier by Will Schwab. I absolutely loved his memoir about the um, book club that he and his mother had when she was terminally ill. This is about him and... Um, why does it say which friend it is? It's, it's, yeah, a guy called Chris Maxley, and they couldn't have been more polar opposites, but they became brilliant friends. So I think that sounds like it could be great. We have Miss Major Speaks, um, which is Toshio Moronic and Miss Major, a conversation with a black trans revolutionary. And this literally is a conversation between them. Um, obviously with the pictures. I do like pictures in a non-fiction book. There we go. There we have a uh, chapter called Nobody's Token Black Bitch, which sounds like it's gonna be intriguing. So we have that one. We also have Pretty Baby by Chris Belcher. This is Chris's memoir of, as a young girl, being um, this pageant queen. Um, I don't know whether it was something she wanted to do or whether it was something that her family made her do. Anyway, she then writes about how years later she is, trying to stay afoot during a PhD program and becomes LA's renowned lesbian dominatrix. Sounds fascinating. Ootlin, a memoir by Jenny Fagan. Jenny Fagan is an author I absolutely love. This is her memoir of a very, very difficult childhood and um, going on into adulthood. And I think this is gonna be fascinating. I've resisted this for a while because I know it's gonna probably break me. So we have that. Then we have Leg by Greg Marshall, the story of a limb and the boy who grew from it. And this is a queer memoir about Greg's life as he comes to terms with um, his disability um, and also his sexuality. And I think that'll be fascinating. Drifts by Natasha Burge. This is about Natasha growing up in Saudi Arabia and at the age of 37, and this links in with Melanie's book, she got a diagnosis of, or, diagnosis of autism and it's how her life changed from there. We have Voice of the Fish by Lars Horn. And the reason I picked this up was it said, um, this is a hallucinatory memoir that explores the trans experience through mediations upon aquatic life and mythology set against the backdrop of travels in Russia and a debilitating injury that left Horn temporarily unable to speak, read and write. So yeah, I think this is gonna be absolutely incredible. Can't wait to read their book. Then we have Harry Nicholas's A Trans Man Walks Into a Gay Bar, a journey of self and sexual discovery. I think it's gonna do what it says on the tin. Harry is a treat. I have followed them on Instagram for quite a long time now. And uh, yeah, they just bring a lot of joy. And I'm actually a little bit disappointed in myself that I haven't read this sooner. Then we have a book that I'm hoping is gonna scratch my um, itch for Tamsin Caladis's book oh i can see the cover but i can't remember what it's called i talk about it on my mum's channel in a video that i think will have gone live yesterday and that is undercurrent by natasha carthew a cornish memoir of poverty nature and resilience i saw kate moss rave about this on her channel which i will link down below if you're not watching moss on a monday where she recommends four books every month you should be then we have stay true by who are sue and this i believe is their story of a friend who uh, died by suicide. And yeah, I think this is gonna be incredibly, incredibly uh, heartbreaking to read. Then we have Arrangements in Blue by Amy Key, which I've only heard people read about in a joyous way, notes on love and making a life. And I believe this is about what it's like to, how do I put it? It's about how, I guess, to make a life for yourself, love yourself. if. And I don't know if it looks at like platonic love versus other love. I'm not sure, but the vibes I've got of it are good. I feel like I'm going to have to listen to a lot of Joni Mitchell because I believe her Blue album has links to this as well, which my mum told me the other week is one of her favourite. Then we have Monsters by Claire Dederer, which is all about 
looking at artists who are deeply problematic and trying to separate them from the art. And I think this is going to be, well, everyone I know that's read this has absolutely loved it. And again, it's another one that I feel like I should have got to this year. Then we have Men at War by Luke Turner, Loving, Lusting, Fighting, Remembering, 1939 to 1945. So looking at men during the war. And I absolutely loved Luke's uh, debut out of the woods which looked at the woods that he loves to go to in Epping Forest and his sexuality and looks at bisexuality, looks at nature, looks at all sorts of things and sort of wraps them really intricately together and I think this is going to be really interesting looking at war. I'm never tempted by books on war but this is one that does tempt me. Then we have a memoir that I don't really feel needs much of an introduction, it's Page Boy, uh, a memoir by Elliot Page. We have, I spoke about him earlier, Mr. Mike Parker. This is his new non-fiction book, All the Wide Border, Wales, England and the Places Between. And I think this really looks at a sort of grey space in between two different places. As I mentioned earlier, I loved On the Red Hill, so I'm really, really excited to get to this one soon. And last but not least, but the one that most recently came into the house, we have Nothing Ever Just Disappears, Seven Hidden Stories by Dermot Hester. And this looks at seven different queer people from history and gives insight into their lives and what they kept hidden or why they kept it hidden goes really nicely with this jumper. What a way to end. So there we go. I will try to remember to li list all of those books down below so that you can let me know one, two, three, or even four or more of those that you'd like me to give a whirl. If you've read them and not enjoyed them, don't tell me that yet, because I'm very excited for all of these. But if you've read them and love them, do tell me about that as well as possibly like voting for them. And also, um, hopefully you've got some recommendations or even some ideas just from the whiz through that I did there. My elevator pitch, still not short enough, but we'll work on it. We'll keep working on it because I am hoping at the end of this year to do a video where I talk about every single book I read in 2023 and try and keep each one to about a minute long. Let's see how that goes. Anyway, I'm going to go. I hope you're all doing super duper well. As always, thanks for joining me. It's always lovely to chat to you. Let's keep the conversation going in the comments down below. If you want more savage reads and um, then you can find my instagram my patreon my wish list all those things down below too and if you want to subscribe that's lovely if you want to like it that's lovely too i will see you all in another video very very soon bye